What's up everybody? I hope you're doing well. Welcome to the extended cut, minimally edited podcast version of this week's video. Today I was inspired to expand on one of the questions that came up in last week's Q&A video. Uh, by the way, that video was not released to Spotify because I did a sort of field trip version of that video and the audio was not super great. So you can find that video on my YouTube channel. That video focused on answering early career related questions for therapists. And one of the questions that came up in that video just really stuck with me and I thought it might be interesting to make an entire episode all about that question. The question I wanted to focus on asked about the differences I observed in myself between when I was a new therapist early in my career versus now. I think that question phrased it as like being a veteran therapist, which I, I know I'm not a veteran therapist, but maybe we might say I'm like a seasoned therapist. This year I will be licensed for 10 years coming up this fall. Um, and I was also in graduate school and postdoc doing clinical work since 2008. So whatever the math shakes out to that, it's like 15 plus years. So I've got a little bit of experience under my belt and I can definitely say for sure that the way it feels now to be a therapist is completely different than my experience as a new therapist. So I thought I would share some of the biggest ways I noticed that my experience is different. The experiences I'm gonna share in today's video are purely anecdotal. I'm sure a lot of folks can relate with a lot of my experiences and there may be some things in here that you absolutely don't relate with at all. So I'm just reflecting on the differences between what I observed in myself as a new therapist versus now. If you've noticed items that I don't name on this list or you have like different opposite experiences from me, feel free to name those in the comments below so the other folks can also glean from your experience as well. Okay, without further ado, in no particular order, here are some of the differences that I've observed in myself between early career therapist Marie and now. One of the things I felt I needed to do in those early days, whether I was a grad student, working as a trainee, or even in my early licensure days working in private practice, was I felt I needed to say yes to every single new client that I was qualified to treat. If I was in graduate school, it felt like I needed to say yes because I needed to accrue my hours, I needed to accrue clinical experience, and I just I just needed to, I guess. <laughs> and if it was in my early private practice days, it felt like I needed to say yes to everybody because I gotta pay my bills, I gotta fill my practice. Beggars can't be choosers, and so if I'm picky about who I work with, then I'm not gonna have a full caseload. Since then, my perspective has changed drastically. I mean, if you followed my videos for any amount of time, you know, I'm all about niching down when possible. So I now have a very specific niche and I'm privileged enough to be able to only accept clients that fit right in that niche. And I have plenty of referrals that I can offer to folks who don't quite fit so that somebody who's a better fit for those folks can treat those folks. Now, some of that's a, just a byproduct of time passing. So, you know, my marketing is stable and I have enough folks coming in to fill my practice. I've mentioned before, most of my income now comes from private practice skills anyway. So even if I didn't have a practice at all, my income is generally sustained. So there's no pressure there. But also by niching down and being very specific about who I specialize in, I tend to get a lot more inquiries from that as well. So from the perspective of, you know, filling my practice, paying my bills, things like that, it makes more sense to be picky anyway. And also from the perspective of, you know, being the best therapist I can be, having a fulfilling career, working working with folks who are most likely to feel like they're going to benefit from my care, I think it's kind of a win-win-win all around because I'm really working with folks that I'm super well equipped to work with. They're probably gonna have a really positive experience and I don't have to feel like I'm sort of fumbling together good care for folks who are a little bit more outside my specific wheelhouse they can be cared for well by somebody who really specializes in working with them. Another thing that's changed over the years since I started that's probably the most felt change as far as like my lifestyle as a professional <laughs> is when I first started out and well into my early years as a licensed therapist, I felt like I needed to over prepare for every single session. I needed to have a very clear plan using evidence-based treatments, and I would spend sometimes 30 minutes or an hour preparing for every single session just to make sure I was on my A game. Now, don't get me wrong, I am still very much implementing 
evidence-based approaches as I meet with my clients. But what I came to find is, first of all, when I over-prepared those sessions for those clients, I'd show up to session and probably more than half the time, we'd end up scrapping whatever I had planned because new things pop up and we still need to utilize the same techniques that I was implementing with the clients, but maybe you know they broke up with their partner this week and so we're going to be applying those techniques to this item rather than you know maybe dealing with the panic attacks that we've been focusing on before. It, it, we had to pivot quite a bit because life happens. In addition to realizing that I often needed to throw the agenda that I'd made out the window so it was kind of time wasted, I've also rehearsed these tools over and over and over again with clients so many times that I just don't need to prepare in order to know what the plan is, if that makes sense. I already know what the plan is for the next session by the time we're signing off from our previous session, and we can also hold it loosely when we arrive for the following session just in case new items have popped up and we need to pull a different tool out of my existing toolbox. So now I take a much more improvisational approach with my clients. I mean, we have a very clear treatment plan set out. We utilize evidence-based approaches to treat whatever it is that they're wanting help with. And I'm aware that we need to be flexible, that the treatment plan moves around the happenings of their life live as they come up. And so I can just keep pulling different evidence-based tools out of my back pocket as those things happen live. So generally now I spend maybe just two or three minutes preparing for each session beforehand, just to kind of refresh my memory of where we left off. I'll read the prior treatment note, jot down maybe two or three bullet points of where we thought we would pick up from, and then as I meet with the client, I check in to see if they'd like to pick up where we left off or if there's anything new that's come up. As I was reflecting on this question of what's different now versus when I started, there's this memory that came to mind that feels kind of like a small detail, but I remember it so clearly and the contrast between how I did things then versus now is so stark <laughs> that it feels worth mentioning. And it's really just that I was so anxious in the minutes leading up to session about whether my client was coming whether they were there, if they were already there sitting in the waiting room, did I miss that they had showed up, you know, through whatever system I had set up to know that the client was there. And I've worked in like every iteration of in-person setups. I've had iterations where there was a front desk receptionist who was supposed to pop back and let me know when my client was there. And I would think, you know, did the receptionist forget to pop back? Maybe the receptionist went out on a bathroom break real quick and my client's waiting and I don't wanna be late. I don't wanna be late. That was the big emphasis for me. So I would be checking the waiting room. I would be, you know, pacing around the office, trying to play it cool. Like, okay, it's fine if my client's late. And then kind of thinking like, should I call my client? If our session's at four, do I call at 402? Or that, no, that's just Marie, you're being ridiculous people are two minutes late all the time. They're not missing their session. So do I wait till no 405, 410? And then my thoughts would already just be spiraling in an unhelpful direction at 405, thinking, okay, if my client is no showing, I have to think about my cancellation policy. I hate having to contact my client and let them know that they still owe me for the missed session when they no showed. And I'm already fretting about having to have that conversation because it was so uncomfortable for me at the time to have have that conversation. And then I just literally would be pacing around my office, thinking about these things, checking the clock, poking my head out in the waiting room over and over and over again until 10 minutes passed when I would call my client and then hopefully reach them to see if they were coming or if they were just late. Oh, doesn't that just sound exhausting? I feel exhausted remembering that and it's not even happening right now. <laughs> and then now if a client is late, I just kind of receive it. <laughs> I will check one time on the hour just to make sure I didn't miss something. I have a little light switch system in my current office for clients to push the button and a light pops on. So if the light's not on, I think, oh, maybe they're sitting in the waiting room, they forgot to push the button. So I pop my head out one time. Or if it's a virtual session and they haven't logged into the waiting room, I'll click refresh on my screen one time on the hour. And then if they're not there, I just, do something I enjoy. I catch up on a text message with a friend. 
I maybe start a game of solitaire on my phone, just anything that feels kind of low key and chill that it can pass, you know, a couple of minutes of time. I'm not going to be like reading the news headlines or like diving into something more intense, but I kind of enjoy that time. <laughs> to be honest. It's like a bonus break in my day. And I like to think that even though that's kind of a selfish perspective of like, I'm just gonna enjoy my time, hopefully when my client shows up and they're potentially frazzled because they feel bad that they're late or they were scurrying through traffic to get there, I'm kind of zenned out. <laughs> and so they can hopefully receive some of my zen vibes <laughs> when I'm thinking like, oh, no worries, here we go, let's just start now, it's all good. Um, so it's for me and it's for them, I think. At least that's what I tell myself. <laughs> I also noticed a pretty significant difference in how I approached console group or supervision in my early days compared to now. Early on, I was terrified at the idea of looking like I was incompetent or I didn't know what I was doing as a therapist. And now in retrospect, it's what a silly idea because when you're a trainee or even just in your early years of licensure, of course, you're still learning. So how could you expect to know everything there is to know if you're in your, you know, first year practicum placement <laughs> as a 21 year old, or at least I was <laughs> like, of course, I didn't know what I was doing. I know I knew very little. <laughs> so I laugh at that now. And it's also really helpful, regardless of how seasoned, how veteran you are as a therapist to always have that learner's mindset, a sense of humility of like, I don't know everything there is to know. So let me let that show, especially in a context like supervision or consult group, where hopefully I'm allowed to be vulnerable and ask for help because that's going to help me the most and therefore also help my clients the most. So in those early days, I was terrified by the idea of revealing that maybe I made a mistake in a session, which of course I made mistakes in sessions because first of all, we all make mistakes in sessions because we're all human. And in those early days, you're just still learning. And I really hate admitting this next part, but in those consult group type settings, because I wanted to look like I knew what I was doing, I was completely the know-it-all person in those groups. And you know, there's something to be said of like, if somebody's feeling stuck and they're asking a question and you genuinely know the answer to the question or you feel pretty confident that you know the answer to the question, by all means, share your knowledge. That's the whole point. <laughs> but I definitely had some, some sass. I had some sass about it. I do not feel proud of right now reflecting back, but that was definitely an overcompensation for feeling incompetent or fearful that I might look incompetent. So it was sort of like, oh, you didn't know that the DSM said da 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 da, -da as criteria number five for this very specific diagnosis. I thought we all knew that. I mean, mm -mm -mm, maybe I didn't frame it quite so sassy. I hope I wasn't quite that sassy. And now it's completely different because I'm aware that all of us have different areas that we've kind of rehearsed that we're super familiar with and then areas that are just kind of on the fringes of our knowledge. And of course, we don't have all the diagnostic criteria of anything memorized for most of us. <laughs> That's why we, you know, open the DSM to check or, you know, we don't have everything memorized of every therapeutic technique. That's why we keep learning and relearning whatever it is that we're implementing and applying with our clients. So now I take much more of a humble mindset when it comes to asking for help, asking for advice, and also when it comes to offering knowledge that I have that somebody else might be asking about. And also when it comes to consult group or supervision, I have a much clearer sense now about when it's a good idea to consult and also what specific details about a case I need to share in order to get adequate consultation. I think in the earlier days, I might have presented something as a clinical thing that I needed to consult on about a client, but in reality, I was probably needing some space to vent or kind of check in, say like, hey, am I doing, am I doing this right? <laughs> I'd often find myself just kind of trailing off on random details about a client saying that I needed clinical support on some thing when actually I probably could have just said like, hey, can I just kind of process for a second? I had this session and I'm feeling kind of weird about it. And can I just tell you about what happened and then share about how it feels? And maybe you can just 
give me any feedback. If you catch anything fishy, <laughs> then it feels like you give the other folks in your group a lot more context or your supervisor a lot more context for what you're needing in that moment. Because then what would happen is the people in my console group or supervision would give me very clinical feedback. And then we would be stuck on a conversation for a long time because I wasn't probably getting what I needed just yet when I could have just said like, hey, can I just vent for a quick second? Can, can you tell me if I miss something or can I just process my feelings? And then probably would move on much faster and, you know, respect other people's time as well. Another thing that comes to mind as I recall those early days is if a client brought up something that was outside of my worldview, outside of my belief system, or just, you know, outside of my life experiences, I felt so uncomfortable and I didn't know what to do with that discomfort. And I would respond by trying to look like everything was just fine, <laughs> even though I had no idea what to do. And now I feel much more comfortable with experiences that to me are rather foreign or even beliefs that I disagree with or don't understand. Uh, it just feels like a curiosity. Like, oh, here's something new about this person that I haven't gotten to know yet. And maybe it's a category of experience that I haven't gotten to know. And there's kind of a, a newness, a learner's mindset that I experience in those moments. It feels more exciting, even if I feel like I totally don't understand yet what's going on. I imagine some of that shift is just because, you know, it's happened so many times that you know, you kind of just rehearse something uncomfortable enough, it becomes less uncomfortable. But I'm also hoping at least that some of it is my own growth as a person, that um, I'm much more accepting and open-minded because sometimes people's experiences really are quite different than mine. Maybe the way that they voted is really different than I voted, even if I feel very strongly about why I voted a certain way. I can still feel curious about it now rather than judgy or uncomfortable. So I really hope that that reflects my own kind of expanding openness to different people, different worldviews, different, just the differences, all the differences that exist between us as humans. Another thing that I used to do in the early days is I would second guess almost everything that I did with my clients, particularly like once the session ended and I'd sit down to write my notes, I would just kind of have like a little internal crisis mode of like, what the heck was I doing? <laughs> Do I even know how to be a therapist? What, I thought I was doing this clinical tool, but I might have implemented it all wrong or that might not have been the right situation. And I would freak out and try to contact other folks or do some frantic Googling to see if whatever I implemented with the client was the right call. And now I feel much more comfortable after each session. I'd say what shifted is rather than second guessing what happened in a specific session or a particular intervention I did that day, I'll reflect more on all of the sessions I've had with a client as a whole, or maybe the last five sessions and think like, hey, are we trending overall in the correct direction over several sessions? And if it feels like we've had a few sessions in a row that just aren't quite clicking overall, then I'm definitely gonna consult with folks. I'm gonna kind of check in, like, am I missing something here? Am I off base somewhere? Because yeah, any particular intervention or moment is not necessarily worth nitpicking apart. If overall you're hitting the marks and the client is experiencing the improvements that they're hoping for. Another thing that's changed quite a bit for me is how I define success as a therapist. I used to define my success based on each and every single client improving, improving all the way to, you know, achieving all of their goals completely and fully. And if I ever saw anything that looked like evidence that my client had not improved to the extent that they wished by the time we came to an end of therapy, I felt like I had failed. And though I think we should always evaluate the effectiveness of our treatment in general, as well as the effectiveness of our treatment with each individual client, I don't think our success as a therapist should depend on all of our clients improving because that's just way too much power. <laughs> so I think if we are effective as therapists, we're going to see generally 
that clients are improving, but there will always be clients who don't improve. When that happens, we definitely should reflect on that, evaluate it, consult on that. You know, what happened in the situation that this client didn't experience improvement or isn't experiencing improvement, but I don't necessarily think that means that we're not successful because then all of us aren't successful. All of us have clients, at least sometimes, who don't improve. <laughs> so there's got to be more to this story than that. And kind of in a similar vein of many of the items I've named so far, back in the day, if I ever felt stuck with a particular client, I used to feel like I was a complete failure. And now when I feel stuck with a client, I just think, you know, probably another set of eyes looking at this situation will help me know where to move next. I'm not failing, I'm just, maybe I'm missing something here. I didn't catch something. I think we're probably seeing some themes here, but I'm just gonna keep it going <laughs> and listing out the things I came up with. Another thing that's changed quite a bit over the years is I used to feel like I needed to have a front of professionalism whenever meeting a new therapist. And now I just feel like I should be Marie. Marie the therapist is the same person as Marie the mom, as Marie the gardener, etc. So just, be Marie. And similarly, I really felt like I needed to dress a certain part back in those days. I mean, I remember I wore suits to my practicum experiences with heels, even in settings where you're on your feet most of the day. And not to say that people should or should not wear suits or heels to work, but for me, that very much felt like I was putting on a suit of professionalism, quite literally but it didn't quite feel like myself. And now I definitely think about my appearance when I show up for work. I like to look like I put some thought into the way I am looking because I think that does convey that we care about our clients. However, I like to present as some version of me. If there's some fun accessory I wanna wear or if my shoe has a fun color or whatever, I'm gonna do it <laughs> because hopefully showing up as Marie is gonna be the most helpful way to show up for my clients. And it's also the most comfortable I can be as well, so everybody wins. Another approach that I took in the early days is I used to be of the belief that it's almost never appropriate to self-disclose to the point of being awkward with my clients. I've since changed my approach and I do like to try to find ways to lean into self-disclosure if it's apparent that it's for the client's benefit, especially when it's kind of lighthearted sharing that also might potentially make the conversation we're having a little bit easier. When self-disclosure happens in the right moments, not only can it help our client feel more connected with us, but it can also kind of propel the conversation forward in a helpful way. Another belief I used to hold in the early days that actually took me longer than some of these other items to let go of was that having a busy caseload was a sign of success as a therapist. And Though if your goal is to have a busy caseload, by all means, have a busy caseload. <laughs> but I've since come to embrace that whatever size caseload makes sense for me and my life in a given season of life is success for me. For example, I've shared so many times that right now I only see clients one day a week. At most, I'll see eight clients in one week and that's my full caseload. It's not a busy caseload, and that's what success looks like for me today in this season where I'm leaning into private practice skills as another avenue to express myself professionally and generate income, and while I'm leaning into giving a huge amount of my energy to my girls while they're in their early preschool years and uh, taking up a lot of emotional energy, at least for me. So who knows, maybe someday I'll have more clients, maybe someday I'll have less, and all of it can be successful. <laughs> and another belief that I definitely held in my early days, even if I didn't say it explicitly, was that having the most knowledge was the most important thing when it came to being an effective therapist clinically. And since then I've come to fully embrace that the most important thing is being present with our clients the knowledge supports our ability to be present and care for them, but the knowledge is not the most important thing because if we have the knowledge and we're not present, 
we're not going to get anywhere helpful. And I've come to find that if I want to emphasize being present to my clients as the most important thing, that becomes the motivator for seeking more knowledge. Because if I want to be present and there's something coming up that I'm not knowledgeable about, I want to go find that knowledge so that I can just show up and not have to worry about whatever knowledge might be related to that need if that makes sense. <laughs> well, I'm sure there's more things I could name on this list, but that felt like it was already quite a few. So I think I will leave off here, but it seems pretty clear to me as I go through this list that I was definitely anxiety prone in those early days and quite insecure. And I mean, to be fair to my younger self, I went into grad school at age 21. So I can be kind to myself because I was quite young in those days. And I mean, regardless of age, all of us can be prone to anxiety, feeling insecure. And there is something to be said about doing something over and over and over again. It just feels a little bit more comfortable over time. And that's definitely been the case for me. Well, I hope you found this video encouraging and validating, especially those of you in your early days, maybe you relate with some of the things on this list. And I'd love to hear from others what sorts of things you noticed have changed about yourself throughout the span of your career, whether you're still in your earlier days or if you've been doing this for decades. <laughs> and until next time, from one therapist to another, I wish you well.